Hey everybody, welcome back to the Petapixel podcast. Look, everything's back to normal again. There's no bathrobes or blown out backgrounds or weird microphone issues here. Jaron's back in his basement. Chris is in his basement. I'm in my basement. Everything's the way that Where it was we always meant to see. Uh, how you doing, Chris? Uh, I'm doing okay, Jordan. We had a lovely vacation. Now we're back and it's going to be hell week and that's okay. We're going to get through it. Yeah, you'll see some results very soon. Um, Jaron, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. It was really busy. So we're recording this uh, on Tuesday morning, uh, just shy of an hour after Apple completed their whole thing. So, explosion. Yeah. so we're racing to get our thoughts together <laughs> right now. Yeah, we have we have things to talk about because it's uh, there's significant changes to, uh, I guess, how I perceive Apple as a company. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things going but we on. Won't- we won't just be talking about fruit today. There's lots of other stuff to talk about as well. So don't worry. Oh, fruit. Yes. Yes. Um, so before we start, as always, I got a quick question. People want to know more about all of us. So I want to know, what was your first photo and video editing software that you ever used? Oh, dude. So, so this might take you a sec. Oh, do you know? You've got know. it ready to oh, go? Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go, so, Chris. The first one I ever used was Kai's Power Tools. I think I mentioned this before. Oh, you have mentioned that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Kai's Power Tools. And it and it's because just complete whim, it came free with one of the computer boards that I bought, right? It was basically bloatware, and I tried it out. And, you know, it wasn't great, um, but it, it let you, like, do, like, it was, like, Frankenstein stuff back then. You would do plastic surgery on people, and you would, like, crop and chop and transform and skew, and all the stuff we take for granted now was way harder back then. But that At was the time, the first it was just one. breaking your brain. Yeah, and then I think I touched, a, like, Corel Painter a little bit, and then I was Ooh. just like, F all this, I I'm going back to film and I just went back to black and white film. I would, what was your first video editing software? Chris? Oh, I never edited video. I, you know, if I, well, you, know, do, you now, do now. So at some point first happened. <laughs> oh, I guess so. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Uh, <laughs> That's how first uh, works. I guess it would, uh, uh, I guess Can it you would put be... the definition of first on screen. Well, oh, I just, I thought you wanted like a, a like a, a virginal answer, not a 40 year old virginal answer. So <laughs> no, it would. <laughs> It would have been. Uh, it probably would have been DaVinci Resolve. I think. Wow. Really? That is an yeah. that is an interesting one to pop your video editing cherry on. Like, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know that I would have done that. I I opened she DaVinci con- Resolve. She was, she was rough, but in a way I liked. It all worked out. <laughs> I learned lots. The hard uh, one. Mine actually was Photoshop. Uh, probably CS two. Uh, and the reason I had access to that is because I went to a school where all of our computers had Photoshop on them. And like I was editing yearbook pictures and uh, newspaper stuff because I was the editor of both those. So that's where I got my first like dabbling in ed- photo editing. I was also using it for like, graphic design and stuff, too. So um, and then my first uh, video editor was Premiere. Uh, I started editing in Premiere Geez, long, I can't even remember what version I was on, but I have never. Can you remember the year roughly? I can. Ne- I cannot remember the year either. It must have been in college because I didn't know how to edit video in high school, and I didn't know how to edit video for most of college. So I'm and see, my wife and all my friends were using Avid because they were in the broadcasting they were section serious. of the school. Classy. Yeah. 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 Um, but we eventually moved over to Premiere. So I can't remember what year it was, but it was prob- It was before they did the Creative Cloud thing. So not, not the current version, but like very little about Premiere has changed as far as workflow goes, which is why I keep using it because uh, I'm old and set in my ways. Uh, but yeah, those are my two. I hear you, buddy. And Jordan, you're uh, probably uh, you've been an <laughs> Apple fanboy your entire life. I'm assuming. I th- that's why I wanted to bring this up. Mine was definitely like a unique path um, because I came to photography late, as you both know. Uh, so my first editing suite was Aperture, Apple's uh, photo editing suite, yeah. um, because I was well ingrained into Final <laughs> Cut life, and I was like, these will probably. Worked together great, but they were totally separated. But uh, yeah, great little organization program. It, I, I'm sure they're kicking themselves now because photo editing is the one big gap in their yeah. lineup. They can always they bring it back. Been, like, maintaining they the gave it a like, really oh. good push. They really did give it a good try. And, you know, they were actually getting raw support fairly early. And it just, yeah, they just kind of gave up. Yeah. You remember Lightroom when that just kind of ate, ate their lunch? Yeah. Because uh, Lightroom was, yeah, really gaining steam at yeah. that exact same point. And if you have one software, that's only available you know macs were not as big a thing back then that's as they exactly are now. what it is yeah 
yeah, then Adobe just kind of steamrolled everything. But my first video editing, you know, as a huge Apple fanboy, was also Adobe Premiere uh, on an old Windows machine oh. I custom built. I wasn't a Mac boy yet when I was in high school. <laughs> I bought was. a Firewire capture Ooh. card that I could plug into Dang. there, get footage from my Digital 8 camera <laughs> dropped right in. Uh, it was an absolute horrifying nightmare. And my good friend Tyler Hauser had a Mac with Final Cut. And I very quickly learned that I was on the wrong side of the fence as far as video <laughs> editing. And I haven't left, which is really going to factor into today's stories, I think. I yes. actually, I realize I'm wrong. I remember the first video I edited and I remember that yeah. it was not in Premiere. Uh, I apologize. It, it, it was on my Toshiba laptop, my Toshiba satellite notebook that I had in college. And it was like the one that came free with Windows. It was like Windows Movie. Oh, Windows Movie Maker. Yeah. Yes. That. Yeah. That was Does the that first count? thing we used. I mean, yes. you basically could just like trim. That was like yes. all it could do. That's technically <laughs> trim editing. export. Yeah, um, it is. I, yeah. I remember what I edited too. Uh, I was playing, I, I played intramural basketball and I had my then girlfriend, now wife, record me playing basketball because my mom couldn't watch. My mom always loved watching me play basketball. Oh. So I, I, I did like a highlight reel from for her that I sent her over Very email, cute. I believe. Yeah. Those and who cut three together days. stay together. I've always said it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all right. This is a, a big a big week. We weren't expecting to be able to talk about this much stuff, but there is a lot to go over. Everything from Apple to some drama around Insta360 to questions about the R1 again. So uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get into it right now. This week is all weeks is brought to you by OM System, and today we want to share an incredible deal from our friends there. If you've been thinking about picking up a portable camera or you're looking for the perfect gift for a special occasion, like Mother's Day, <laughs> listen up. Right now, OM System is offering one of their best spring deals yet. You can get the sleek and versatile EM10 Mark IV camera, and guess what? They're throwing in a free, free FREE Mzuiko 14 to 42 2R lens. That's right. Free. Oh, I, I piggybacked on the copy there. <laughs> Normally, this bundle goes for about $1,000. That's not very specific, but for a limited time, it's available for just $699 US. Very specific. That's an incredible savings of $299.99. Also very specific. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. The EM10 IV is perfect for capturing everyday moments to extraordinary adventures. And with that high quality M's Weco lens included, you're all set to shoot stunning photos right out of the box. Whether it's a Mother's Day surprise, oh, I piggybacked on the copy again, oh. or a Father's Day gesture, or congratulatory gift for the recent grad in your life, this deal from OM System is too good to pass up. Wait, so don't wait. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. You didn't know that it was going to say Mother's Day? You just were thinking to yourself Mother's Day? I was thinking Mother's Day. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there's something coming up there. <laughs> Yeah, Evelyn already has a camera. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't want this. No, she wants something else. <laughs> so don't wait too long. Visit OM's website at explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel and check out the EM10 Mark IV bundle and make someone's day with the gift that keeps on giving and clicking. I added that part myself. The, the Man. Uh, thanks to OM System yeah. again for sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> that you should great. have just written the copy. Yeah, it, you know. Yeah, you were like... Pre <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that was unusual that you managed to actually <laughs> predict the copy before you got there. I like there it. You go. Uh, yeah, thanks again to OM System for sponsoring the podcast. We appreciate it as always. Let's start talking about some stuff that happened this week. And one of the things we'll we'll start it off with. Jordan, you were a fan of this. You texted me last night about it. You like my story. Uh, there was a rumor, and I don't really like rumors, but in this case, rumors are the only reason this is a story. Um, it. And I wrote a story called titled, It Might Not Be Possible for the Canon EOS R1 to Overcome Its Expectations. Mm. And I feel like a lot of people look at the R1 as a concept and think to themselves, Canon is just being bogged down by their own hype. But I do want to remind everyone that Canon has never publicly even admitted that this camera is in development <laughs> at all. Yeah. So any hype 
that you think they're generating is not them. It's entirely the rumor mills. Um, and, you know, I'm partially to blame there, too, because I have sources Wait. that have told me that this camera is has been in development for now, probably going on six years. <laughs> But and we're part of the problem. We did a video on what we'd like to see from yeah. the R1 like yeah. a year ago, yeah. and we're still. Uh. Yeah, I mean, everybody's so. been expecting it. I mean, you know, we talk about how like we don't normally want to trust rumors, but most rumors, it's like, oh, this camera's coming in three months. But this thing, it's like this camera's rumored to be coming for three years. Yeah. So it's gone beyond just a rumor mill. This is Canon. I don't I would be very curious to know how Canon actually feels about all of this stuff. They must love it, to be honest. Unless they're having the troubles that apparently we keep hearing right. about. So I knew uh, a little over a year ago, I knew that the original delay for the R1 was due to a sensor issue. They didn't specify to me what the sensor issue was, which means it could have been they changed the sensor. The sensor wasn't doing what they wanted it to do, that sort of stuff. Um, but now, according to the latest rumor, which I am a little bit in belief of, actually, because it's hmm. related to the sensor, is that it, they're having issues with the buffer. Um, I think they Clearly tried to make enough. this. Yeah, yeah, I think they tried to make this camera better than Sony's A93. And in doing so, are reaching other hardware limitations or bugs related to it. Um, yeah. So that's the current rumor. Take from that what you will. But the overall concept here is that no matter what Canon releases, because of so much conversation from people like us and the internet and fans of cameras, it might not be possible for them to make a camera that actually stands up to the expectations of the last three years. Mm -hmm. Jordan? Yeah, so a few things there, and the processor thing totally makes sense, like the buffer, because we've been saying what seems to be the limiting factor on a lot of Canons has been the processor lately. We're really seeing stuff that seems like that is the bottleneck, features that are missing when you're in different modes, things like that. Um, I want to I wanna do a hypothetical, because like you said, Jaron, I don't think no matter what they deliver, people are going to be disappointed at this point, unless it's like a completely revolutionary new type of image capture we've never seen before. Let's go back three years. And if they had simultaneously launched the R3 with an R1 with a stacked version of the R5 sensor, so like a 45 megapixel stacked sensor for a $2,000 premium, let's say, theoretically. Over that the R3? Like it would make sense. Over the R3. So it would have been Exactly. $8, they would still absolutely get trashed for something being so overpriced on at this like i don't think there was ever a way with the r3 positioned where it is that they were gonna win on this and i really don't think they saw the a1 and the, the z9 uh coming at all you really um, think so like, you really think they were completely surprised by nikon and and sony not only beating them on or matching them or beating them on every spec but also beating them on price you really don't think they saw that coming at all uh i I don't, honestly. No, uh, no I, I do think they were kind of expecting like the price of the flagship cameras. Hey, we're jumping to mirrorless now. It's always been like, you know, their pro DSLRs have been quite expensive. Um, oh, and I think and you they were think... kind of expecting that to continue. Like, yeah, okay. you know, if you look at inflation and a classic like a 1DX2, you know, they could totally be like, oh, this new flagship camera is $8,500 US. That makes sense for us historically what happened is that the floor for flagship pricing also kind of dropped out at this i mean we were all very surprised with especially the z9 pricing mm -hmm. uh which was cheaper than a d6 uh that's a really interesting way i don't think canon was expecting it to go and then r3 mm -hmm. is launched they're already getting accused for being overpriced they're like we have to rework this entire strategy yeah, the R3 that's been about three high. years so it would make sense for me um and then certainly a global shutter would be a compelling like this is kind of the breakthrough for that they start developing that a couple of years ago <laughs> sony eats their lunch again this time and i can see how they'd just be like head in their hands like what are yeah. we gonna do to make this flagship make the splash it's been delayed so much i think jaron's point is exactly right like people are going to be let's preemptively just like you will be disappointed when this <laughs> thing comes out it's still That's gonna tough. be a great camera yeah, but yeah, I guess. but regardless whether they saw it coming or not, as Jordan said, it's got to be a, a kick in the pants to see all of these improvements coming out. And maybe, who knows? Maybe they were like, "Oh, we were going to launch this two years ago. Oh, and then this camera comes out. Now we got to go back to the drawing board." And and then, oh, we're going to release it next year. And then, of course, then stack sensors come out, and now we've got you know Sony's A nine three and stuff. And they're just like, 
they they must just be getting pushed back further and further to i mean how far can you go and and uh, they don't really have i don't think canon really has necessarily the infrastructure or the r&d to really match these other companies right now i don't think anybody well, expected Nikon, Nikon to be so affordable um that was i think that was just a, a good strategy from nikon to be like let's release an excellent camera at a really good price and get market share back and i think that was smart at the same time as you say making it so that canon can't release a ridiculously priced camera even if it's not historically ridiculously priced because everybody's yeah. gonna be like well i could get a nikon and lenses for the same amount as your body why would i do that and uh, at the same time, too, I think, I don't know, megapixels aren't everything, right? The no. rumor is this thing is going to be a 30 megapixel stack sensor. Which is fine. But, Makes perfect which sense is for fine. sports. Yeah. But that still puts it into the realm of this is a camera for sports action and journalism, wildlife, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Does that then look bad compared to the Z8, Z9, which has a mo- far more like mass appeal for yeah, do many anything different with this ca- same same philosophy as the A1? I was going to say like, the like, A1 yeah. too. I, some of the the conversation has been that Canon was more surprised by the A1 uh, because it combined things that they can't do. I mean, so far they haven't ever could shown it, that they yes. could do this, which is yeah. high resolution and high frame rate. Yes, yeah, which they can't. They've never done so. Um, it's a really tough position for Canon to be in. Uh, I feel bad for them. Um, but this also, I don't know if, if, this, if this will ever end up being true, but I don't know if you feel, feel this way, guys. But it feels like, as Chris just mentioned, that they have been developing this camera multiple times. Like, it's, mm-hmm. they never, like, I think the best way to develop product is to start with a goal and complete it. But to me, it seems like, they started with a goal and have now had three separate goals stacked on top of that over yeah. time. They just keep looking over their shoulder yes, keep, at what everyone else is doing. Keep resetting just, it to like, okay, well, now we need to do this. And then there's cascading effects when you do yeah. that. Because um, otherwise it can't take five years to make a camera or it shouldn't. You know what I mean? Like, right. Three, is, three d- is the average. Four yeah. would be ex- fine for something truly groundbreaking. Five, yeah. we're now assuming that Canon didn't plan an R1 when they launched the mirrorless camera in 2018. That yeah. is giving them the benefit of the doubt. They definitely did. Yeah. yeah. They had RF mount versions of their super telephotos done, like, you know, at the same time as like that janky SR was announced, yeah. right? Which yeah. felt like it was slapped together on a weekend and everybody was just like hands off the table like it was a baking <laughs> show or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would say it's been closer to six years that they've been working on it. And that's a really long time for any camera yeah. and six years in technology stand. That's so long. A lot yeah. has changed. That's what I mean, right? You develop something and already it's outdated by the time that you're actually ready to release. So, so at this yeah, point, uh, Canon's really only choice is to release this camera and know they're going to take a loss. Like, yeah. it, it could be a fantastic camera still. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the R3 I mean, is a fantastic camera. It's just poorly priced. There's a lot to like about it. It's poorly priced and it's very specialized. Yeah. And so I I, like I, it. I, and it might not work with your eyeballs. <laughs> and I just I didn't even turn that I, on because I was afraid it wasn't going to and it was going to ruin my shoot. So I, n- I never try new features <laughs> with, a, with a camera just, like that. I don't want to see the R1 just be another R3 where people look at it and say, oh, that's cool. It handles well, but it's very specialized. It's expensive. Why would I get that? I just don't, I don't want that to happen for them. I'm kind of feeling in, in, in a negative cynical way that it, it is starting to look like that. Hopefully they'll prove yeah. me wrong. Yeah. You can always hope for that. We don't ever want anyone to fail. No, 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 we no, want no. this to be successful. And you know, Canon, their leadership has got to be under a lot of pressure too, because their, their imaging division lost money. They're not making a profit. Um, like their profit fell maybe they are making profit their profit fell so like the, not only are they making less money they're not making anything <laughs> exciting and they haven't released yeah. this camera and the olympics well, and the r1 is n- the r1's not going to be a windfall so if i'm canon i'm like get that r52 out there now so we can start yeah. actually building something that we're going to sell massive quantities of yeah because the r1 more and more i'm just getting the idea this is going to be a very specialized tool yeah mm. if it ever comes my now i'm wondering if they even do it at this point like maybe not okay moving on insta 360 had a terrible week <laughs> <laughs> We touched on this. We talked about this last week. Yeah. And, and it l- just kept snowballing. A little bit the week before we touched on, we were talking, it's just because the X4 launched. And then we touched on them, like what happened last week. Well, there's a recap. Uh, 
it was revealed that Insta360's PR team had been encouraging some content creators to not mark sponsored content as sponsored. And this all kind of happened during Golden Week in China, which meant there was nobody there. Golden Week <laughs> the is... The phone's just <laughs> ringing off the hook. Yeah, so that's why our story... We did a story finally with, that explained the whole situation and got Insta360s to, to comment on it. Which, by the way, nobody bothered to actually ask Insta360 any questions except yeah, us. That says so much about the current state of things. Which is yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, but I will link to the full story in the description below. But Jordan, do you, Chris, do either of you want to summarize what happened and like f- t- tell everyone what to expect <laughs> going forward? Because this is this is bad, bad for them. Yeah, yeah. And last week we had a comment just saying like, "Hey, were you guys encouraged not to reveal uh, that your X four overview that we did on the podcast was sponsored content?" Which we didn't because it wasn't. Uh, that Correct. was just a model that was sent in for review. Uh, but online, uh, Farouk, who goes by iPhoneDo, said like, hey, just so you know, they're telling creators, hey, would you guys mind not labeling things as sponsored content when you post it? Is that cool with it, everybody? Everybody down with that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, legally, not down with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was private correspondence between some other creators. This is not something that we saw with the X4 there. Uh, but for obvious reasons, this is illegal and it's deceptive. And it would really violate the trust that viewers have in the creators who are making content for them. You know, sponsored content needs to be clearly labeled. Um, So that is why this was such a big deal that kind of blew up this week. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, we could, we can speak to our experiences with them. I mean, we, we've never been told don't, disclose that it's sponsored but we have you know i mean there is a a back and forth and and you know they have had we've had people say things like well you know maybe don't make it so prominent or try to change how it's perceived and again we don't really like to play that game because as jordan no and we and we didn't in that situation did not was still still feedback it is is just can we minimize the sponsored content element of it uh, which is still very shady we're not going to do that (laughs) no yeah so Um, we say that it's sponsored content we want to be clear that it's sponsored or content because yeah it, it is a violation of trust it shouldn't be done insta360 told us that in quotes the issue about asking creators to mention or not mention sponsored post we investigated this internally it was an isolated incident that affected a handful of creators probably less than 15 or so out of 1500 that's what they said um they are chalking it up to people at the company who as they've grown faster than I think that they have intended to because they've gotten very big very quickly. They had to hire yeah. more people. Those people were not properly trained or they're, or they're, they weren't reading their manuals correctly. And then they weren't getting proper oversight, which uh, allowed this to happen. Um, mm-hmm. The company says they admit they did this happened, which rare company admits that they made a mistake. So already a good start. Uh, and this is not a practice that the company supports at any level. So they have admitted that it was it happened. They're sorry. They're they're working internally to make sure it doesn't happen again. But you have to ask, like at what at this point, I guess the people who are paying attention, will anyone re- How long will it take to earn that trust back? It's gonna hurt. Yeah, I I honestly, you know, not like in their defense, I guess to some degree, it's like I can't see a company effectively wanting all of their all of their their influencers to then like say it's not sponsored when it is only because that would be a true recipe for disaster like that's not something that you can control or or command or or get away with like so it would easily get out as it even did here with the small amount of people they're saying that got it got out with like mm-hmm. i can't see them ever using that as a proper strategy i know it's it's easy to think like oh of course they want to be nefarious and evil and get the upper hand by doing this but i can't see in any world where this would actually be a positive thing and now of course the reputation is in the dirt and as jaren says it's gonna take a long time for them to rebuild that not only with consumers but also with Press creators. and media and influence, creators, right? Yeah. Who are going to be like, look, I, I don't want to touch this now with a ten foot pole because everybody's going to assume or now think that I am in some way compromised, right? It, and it's just such a slippery slope. Like with the rise of you know influencers who are not reviewers, are not journalists. Yeah. Uh, we're starting to really see like you know how much of this is actually being labeled, how much is being disclosed, uh, and this is just going to further 
first of all, add to mistrust with viewers, but also it's just like everyone's standards are going to keep on slipping and slipping and slipping. Yeah. And it's a matter of like, you know, hey, are we charging a $5,000 premium to not disclose that this is a sponsored ad on an already sponsored ad? Yeah. I could absolutely see some people, not us, doing that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I want to speak to also like, Jordan and I, our first YouTube show was for a camera retailer. And so, of course, there was a very obvious conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest, right? Yep. And we worked very hard to make sure that wasn't an issue. To and, the chagrin of our employers at yeah. some point. And, and manufacturers, too. You know, yeah. And so that was, a, that was tough. And we did it because we wanted people to trust us and believe us. And we did build a solid reputation, which is why we're where we are today. But at the same time, you know, joining outfits like DP Review and Petapixel, we joined those outfits because they're actual journalistic outfits with integrity that follow the rules, that know the rules, you know, that are that are part of that world. I mean, there's a whole world of this when we talk about press. And so, yeah, there's this interesting feeling, like, like Jordan says, where you've got a world of influencers who are not part of a journalistic world, and then you've got press who are part of a journalistic world. And so, you know, we're, we appreciate all the people that follow our channel because they want that trust and integrity. And, and I get that it's a slippery slope because manufacturers might want people that aren't necessarily uh, bound by those, those codes of ethics, you know? So, huh. yeah. But we are, we are. <laughs> yeah. And we will continue to be. Yes, exactly. Yes. And we'll be well, clear about what is paid and what is not paid. And we'll, we, we never change what we say or our biases when it comes to the, our reviews. What stinks is even when you're not, People assume you're sponsored, even when you're not. We've talked about this before, but it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's very frustrating when it's it's like, you know, I really, sometimes I really wish we were paid as much as people think we are, because uh, that certainly <laughs> would make our lives a lot easier. Um, we're not paid that often. Just pointing that <laughs> It's not yeah. very often. And if, and if we get paid, if we get paid by the manufacturer, we label it as sponsor content, and we make it very clear that those are not reviews. Those yeah. are yeah. features. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Insta 360's bad week didn't end there, actually. <laughs> they, hey, uh, what? Yeah, they, uh, yeah, we're a third of the way down the list. <laughs> yeah, the, well, the third part I decided to cut because it came from a source I couldn't verify. So we're only going to go two. But hey, there's no, that okay. journalistic integrity again that we were just talking oh. about. Oh. <laughs> just <laughs> dripping <laughs> off Jaron wow. right now. Thanks, Pesky Ed. ethics and morality. Ugh. Um, GoPro says that Insta360 violated multiple of its patents. And the U.S. government said, okay, we'll take a look. Uh, so what what the story is, is that a, a GoPro alleges that Insta360's multiple technologies infringe on its novel and proprietary super view, virtual lens, hyper smooth and horizon leveling technology. For those who don't know, super view is a GoPro tech that takes the four by three aspect ratio and dynamically stretches it to 16 by nine digital lenses. Our GoPro's name for different field of view options that give you the ability to adjust zoom level multiple times across various aspect ratios. It's all digital. Hyper smooth is GoPro's technology for stabilizing digitally, and it works yeah. very well. And then horizon yeah. leveling is another stabilization technology that fits with that, that specifically refers to the camera's ability to keep the horizon in the frame the exact same level. So yeah, those two it, typically it rules. work together. Um, well, Inst for at least two of these, it was easy to find. Insta360 has two technologies that sound very similar to that. Uh, they have what <laughs> they call flow state, which is their gimbal-like stabilization. And then yeah. they also have a horizon lock, which keeps the horizon locked. Um, so in Go GoPro says those are our technologies you infringed, and uh, we would like the U.S. government to look into blocking your imports because of it. Yeah, I mean, those function identically to how they do in a GoPro. Now, the issue with stabilization is it's really tough to back that because the process of like cropping and readjusting the frame has been around since probably those yeah. Adobe products that we mentioned yes. from 10 years ago. Um, however, yeah, something like Horizon Lock, I can absolutely see that being like a you know, an idea that you could absolutely patent uh, that they've both used to really interesting effect. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I haven't seen the patents, but I think they might have a case here. I saw the patents. Definitely things that hit GoPro first. They're Go very ahead. broad. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Very, very broad. 
so we'll see which way this goes. But uh, yeah, it's just one other yeah. reason that the phone is ringing at an empty Insta360 headquarters. That at least they paid Leica some week. licensing fees to put their name on the lens. So that's, you know, I'm sure they, they got some money, I hope. Yeah, that's with the Ace and Ace Pro, I believe, yeah. or maybe just the Ace Pro, which is a very GoPro-esque oh, camera, I might mean. add. Yeah. I mean, you know, and again, like they're, they're one of, I don't know, a thousand companies now making GoPro like so many. Go- I mean, people yeah. have just figured that's the best design for this type of camera. Uh, yeah. You know, over the years, it seems like yeah. that is the default. Um, but yes, those technologies do definitely remind me and function identically to GoPros. All right. Insta 360 is a terrible week as uh, we're done talking about it. Let's talk about what <laughs> happened this morning. And there was quite a bit. Uh, we yes. basically guessed that Apple was going to announce some new iPads today, and they did, but there was more to it than that. Way more than I was expecting. So let's uh, let's do this as a lightning round. Uh, iPad Air. This is now available in two sizes. Uh, one is a 13 inch, and the other is an 11 inch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything good? And new processor, very slim, faster. New, yeah, which new M2 chip. We're going to have a conversation about this in a little while. Uh, the meaningfulness of some of these bumps, but yeah, I mean they've got to keep that line current. There's yeah. nothing exciting or compelling. Can we go to the next one, Jared? We can. <laughs> we now have a new iPad Pro iPad Pro (gasps) features a new type of OLED technology, a brand new chip, the M4, which is also announced today, and a thinner overall body. Uh, It should be noted, this is the first time that Apple has announced a new M series chip in not a computer. They're debuting it in a tablet. So Jordan, you sound like you wanted to talk about this, so you, you, you should go. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, like that new display is really going to open up a lot of possibilities because if you've been editing, you know, even HDR images shot on your phone, you know, your phone had a higher contrast ratio. So the experience of editing them on the tablet wasn't quite as good, but especially like HDR video, clearly they're moving more into that area as we're going to talk about in a little bit. So that's going to pay huge dividends to actually be able to view your HDR content in a very bright display uh 1500 Six, maximum 16 nits. 1600 16. nits oh, okay so here's it's an hdr yeah. before we before we move on to the other stuff in this i do want to touch on this panel because um for anyone who didn't know prior to working at petapixel i worked at digital trends uh looking at televisions and i was trained on like what to look for in televisions by uh, an expert named caleb dennison i texted caleb this morning and i said you need to do a video that explains the difference between QD OLED, which is like the new, the, the currently the yeah. latest version of OLED, which combines quantum dots with self lighting uh, pixels that are OLED, which is makes similar specs, very bright, yeah. highly color accurate, uh, less susceptible to what we call burn in, but it's not really burn in. It's something else, but we call it burn in. And he said, I've never heard of tandem OLED. That's what Apple's calling, yeah. calling this. And huh. I explained what it was. And his response was, why in the world would they do that? And it's (laughs) taking two standard, we're assuming standard, Apple did not mention exactly what OLEDs they're using. I'm assuming they're W OLEDs, white OLEDs, and stacking them on top of each other to combine the outputs. Um, To get a maximum peak brightness, which has been the limiting factor on those. Which wasn't a limit if you just went QD OLED. But there's only one manufacturer of QD OLED in the industry. Do you guys know who that is and perhaps why Apple didn't want to buy it from them? Samsung. It's Samsung. Correct. So they went with a different technology. Now there's another one that the other OLED in the business is LG. And we're very certain that this is an LG OLED, two of them stacked together, but LG has their own OLED technology that basically matches QD OLED um, Mm. these days. As you can tell, this is highly technical, but it's super strange that Apple would create a, quote, new OLED system when there were already two very good OLED systems out there, and I'm not sure what the difference is. We're going to find out and try and figure out, like, why they went with this method over others, um, but I'm not sure what the benefits are here versus standard LG OLED and QD OLED. Maybe it's at pricing. Least, 
Maybe. Yeah, we're, we're in kind of a weird limbo because we saw the announcement this morning, but we're not having a briefing until no. after this podcast is recorded. <laughs> so there will be some conjecture yes, uh, that might already be solved by the time this podcast is released. Yeah. But what is nice, at least, is you can now take projects from your phone to your tablet to your Mac Pro on a Retina display, and you should be able to get similar levels of, of brightness. Yeah, and that's that's, that's a good. huge. Step. That was the missing link in that, that workflow. Link. Yeah. So we both, yeah. Chris. I don't know, Jordan. Do you do you use the previously latest version of the iPad much, or is that just in Chris's hands? Oh, we're, we're, we'll talk about. I have a ten year old tablet <laughs> that I am going to be talking about on okay. this podcast. So, uh, though, but uh, <laughs> Chris and I, I have primarily used Chris's very cutting edge last year's model. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I've been, I've been I primarily using one. the iPad Pro. Uh, yeah. So the iPad Pro has the M2 chip, which now the iPad Airs have. It is a very powerful chip. Like uh, there, there aren't many situations I think for for a lot of creators where they wouldn't need where, where that wouldn't be enough. But this new M4 chip is supposed to be fifty percent stronger, more efficient, less power use, faster, a better GPU, and in, in quite a big jump. So yeah. it looks like iPad is still going with their kick. Well, not iPad. Apple is still going with their kick of trying to make these tablets and phones more gaming friendly. Uh, at the same time, I think creators will like the extra power. Uh, certainly, they're going to like a better battery life, more efficiency. But I never had a problem with the M2 chip. I think it's it's already quite powerful um, mm-hmm. in the iPad Pro. Uh, the Verge published a story a couple days ago ahead of this, which was essentially like the last thing the iPad needs first is more power, like a spec bump. Yeah, um, And that's what Apple has typically done, is they go in with yeah. a spec bump basically every time they update the iPad. But that's not for many creators, what's holding it back. No, it's, it's, it's interface. the interface. And yeah. seeing as they have skipped M3 entirely in this thing and gone <laughs> M4, they made it thinner. They And we'll talk about this in the next section. They made it more usable with other mm. devices in the ecosystem. Um, Jeremy, who helped cover the Apple event today for us at Petapixel, he strongly believes we'll see a iPadOS shift this year. Yeah, I sure hope so. That's something you know, will what, change. What what everybody wants, like my, my main issue with the iPad Pro last year's model with the M2 chip, it still very much felt like an iPad tablet. Like it, it, it reeked of the thing that you give your kids to watch a movie in the car. You know what I mean? Um, and it did have some nice features. I mean, the keyboard's nice. The, the, the Apple Pencil is nice. But that, to me, I think is what they've really changed here now. So there's a brand new keyboard. It now has a function bar on it. There's a brand new pencil, more haptic feedback, extra controls uh, that you can use. Because honestly, the interface controls aren't that great. So the more that you can do with external um, peripherals, great. And, and I think that's really a big push where Apple's trying to say, we get that tablets up to this point have really been kind of a family tablet and we want to get away from that and make the ipad at least the pro series like a laptop and but they've been moving and like we've had logic pro on final cut for a while now like they, they've sure. been moving in this direction but yeah i just feel like this switch is a long time coming but at yeah. what point is it just like we can add a keyboard to it um, with a trackpad. Like it's it's a we laptop. have that already. The current one yeah. has a keyboard and a trackpad. It has yeah. a trackpad. Yeah. Now it's got a yeah. function bar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have an escape key now, too. I think they had an escape yeah. key. Yeah. Big deal. Hot dog. <laughs> but I think these are. I. I. Yeah. But I think these are important moves, right? Is yeah. is to make it. I mean, my main complaint is always going to be the operating system of the iPad. I I don't like it. I, I like it for bringing up Netflix. Yes. I like it for watching YouTube. I don't yeah. like it for importing files off external drives. I it don't like it for, for that. copying and pasting, you know, even off the cloud. It, it's it's Not good. it's weird. It's like a really annoying interface. And so I really hope they change that. Uh I honestly, I think a Mac user could go to the iPad and be like, ah, this is weird, right? Like, it, it, that's it, exactly it, what it's like for me. I, yeah, so I, I think Apple is at this weird p- uh, point where you both have mentioned that the iPad is fantastic for consuming media. Like, it's yeah. really, really good for that. And, and I love powerful. it for that. Yeah. It's powerful. Sure. But it is yeah. not fun to try and no. do anything with the iPad. You can. But there, are, you constantly butt up against limiting factors, yeah. and it, that is entirely a an, an an OS situation. And I think Apple is now at this weird point where they're like, "Well, we want to make it more powerful so that it can be more useful, but at the same time, we don't want to take away from how easy it is to consume media." So if you yeah. change the OS, it makes it harder to use as a consumption device. Maybe or maybe not. I mean, it's not hard to click a shortcut and there you go. Well, right? you also I have mean- to consider that most uh, young kids these days don't 
know how to use a computer. They know yeah, how to right. use a tablet. And so like changing it up now actively undermines the generation that they already I brought suppose. up on swipe. So but them, they, them they, kids are just going to have to learn. They right? really when should they learn go, how to type on a real keyboard and use a real computer. <laughs> yes. When, and when um, they go into like, you know, I mean, looking at Netflix is very different from opening up like Final Cut uh, Pro and, and wanting to actually do something like that. So, you know, there's an investment of knowledge. And, and I, I actually find, although the interface is quite different between Final Cut for Mac and Final Cut for iPad, I found the iPad Final Cut actually to be quite intuitive to use. I didn't yeah. mind that. There's some things we've complained about in our review, and and uh, you know I think those are changing hopefully. But it's not. It's that part wasn't bad. That that's not. It's still very intuitive. It's still very easy. If I can do it, anybody can. It's really more the back end transferring files, um, exchanging. Uh, Pla- like projects across different platforms. One of our main complaints uh, that we had on this original thing was that I could send a project from the iPad to Jordan, but it can't go back the other way. And it looked like maybe it will now, but maybe not. That's kind of yeah. A we're still we waiting address. on confirmation because all it yeah. says is you know to take footage, uh, move it onto an external hard drive, which is great. We really wanted that. No one wants yeah. to clutter up their internal storage. Um, but yes, you can move it on to a Mac. But what we really want is to be able to go back and forth. I want to cut an episode, send it yes. to Chris to drop in and edit his images and give it back to me. Uh, but yeah. That would be like a unified yeah. workflow that would make a lot of sense. I just want to back up really quickly. Um, we talked about like how they keep adding more horsepower to these things. Where do you need the horsepower and what are their examples? It's gaming and they're not showing people playing like AAA titles mashing on the screen. No, they're showing them holding controllers. Uh, which is a separate type of input where you're not touching the screen or they're saying like for professional applications like video editing and logic where check it out. We have this keyboard where you're trying to duplicate a laptop interface. Like none of this is taking advantage of the fact that it's a big flat touch screen interface. That's now incredibly powerful. Uh, so it just seems counterproductive. If you want AAA titles with really good visuals, buy a PlayStation. It's way cheaper <laughs> than a new iPad pro. If you, uh, and exactly the same thing, like grab a laptop, you know, I'm astounded at how good some of the base level Macs are for mm-hmm. doing basic video editing at this point. Again, way less money. These iPad pros are expensive. They are. Mm. Yes. Well, oh, yeah, like uh, over a thousand dollars. I mean, it depends on how I many upgrades you get. See. Whether you get the, the, you can do like a matte glass. Yeah, there's ways to modify it. Uh, They're doing anti-reflective screens for a premium price. (sighs) Only if you buy one with over a terabyte of storage, though. I think it's uh, like 11 inch. You're in deep. The 11 inch costs a thousand and the 13 inch, that's the starting price. That's before you do anything. And then the the 13 inch costs 1300. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you're right. That's multiple PlayStations. Yeah. yeah, but you can't take your PlayStation on an airplane. Should that be our unit of currency? We have knocks for weights. Should we be like <laughs> How this lens is for PlayStation? <laughs> ah, I keep, it changes too much with inflation, you know. But I have to admit, like I use the iPad Pro primarily. Like I, I use it a lot for writing the articles for Petapixel, where I can be out like in my kids' volleyball game and I can get some some writing done. And with the keyboard, I actually find that very handy. Like very yeah. useful. As well, because your laptop s- would drown out the yeah. sound of kids playing volleyball. Yeah, in you couldn't stadium. even hear my laptop so loud you can even hear the whistle blow. You know, and then the, the game won't stop. It's going to be a real problem. You know, plus it's heating the entire gymnasium, and everybody gets these kids are sweating. People yeah. are passing out in the bleach. <laughs> and like, and I'm probably blowing like recreation level center circuits. Because <laughs> it draws so much power. The sodium vapor lights are flickering. Yeah. And the then, way. like, some poor old guy has to wander to the electrical box and be like, oh, I tripped the breaker again. What happened? These <laughs> things are, these things Chris are rated. trying to for write an, an article again. Yeah, they're rated for an industrial kitchen, right? And I go, okay. So, <laughs> so oh, the man. iPad Pro is fantastic for that. It's fantastic for that. I really like it. It's even taken a couple of volleyballs to it and it's survived no problem. So, you know, I. I just wish it was HDR. 
and I wish that I could uh, work off an external drive without having to download all the files, all the video files onto the thing to edit it and then get them all back off, which is just, you know, a nightmare. So, is, so yeah. we're hoping that's what this changes, but we don't know yet. Is that what you're saying, Chris? Well, that's what this changes. I mean, now that okay. we have HDR displays and the ability to use right. external drives, I think that's going to be a huge It's way more useful. Yeah. But it would still be nice for Jordan to be able to send projects from Final Cut for Mac back to the iPad. That we don't know if it's possible yet. Yeah. Okay. This will be great for Chris as a solo creator. Like he will be able to shoot videos, sure. yeah. cut them all himself on Final Cut without bogging up his internal drive. I think it's a real useful workflow. I think yeah. they jumped the gun with Final Cut last year. I, I think they should have waited. And again, to go from a version one to a two within a year is not a very Apple kind of way to go with software as yeah. well. Um, so that was also surprising for me. But uh, do you get new Final Cut software? Speaking that's of that, that's a very good segue into what wow. our main topic is, which is I argue that Apple is finally a real camera company now. And here's mm. my talking point why. Today, in addition to announcing the worst name I can think of, which is Final Cut for iPad 2, uh, they also <laughs> announced Final Cut Camera. Now, this is essentially their version of the Blackmagic mm -hmm. camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Apple is a first-party camera maker. They make the hardware. They yep. make the software to power the hardware specifically. They record ProRes. They make the software to edit it on, Final Cut. They make the computers and the tablets, which you can use that software on. They make yeah. the AI stuff in the background that improves the quality of the cameras that they're working with, which are quite small. Yeah, lots of computational stuff. They do stuff. everything end to end. Mm -hmm. That is more yeah. than any other, quote, real camera company that we would point to does by a country mile. Yeah. Which is longer closest than a regular would mile. be. Closest would be black magic that I could come up with yeah. uh, in terms of having, you know, uh, physical hardware, editing right. software and cameras. Uh, that's but they as close don't as we make, can come. But, but they don't make computers and they don't. They don't make yeah, computers exactly. Yeah. It's still everybody's using those on a Mac. And yeah. so, uh, like some Samsung others, hasn't reached a level to do that. They don't have no. any of the software to do that really. Like, and yeah, their computers Apple and tablets is, aren't good. No, Apple yeah. is Apple is unique. And yeah. uh, it's interesting. I love it. I mean, they were always like, oh, we love our relationship with third party app makers. And we're always open, you know, with our with our, our, our tech so that they can make these things develop for them because that's what they needed. So it's interesting now they're like, but deep down, they're like, oh, I can't wait until we can kick those guys out of here and not have to use them anymore. Right. So well, Looking at the camera, it's worth pointing out there are still real advantages to the Black Magic. They mentioned that this will allow you to record log and ProRes, but not compressed video, mm -hmm. which is something the Black Magic app is great for. You don't have to do huge ProRes HQ files. You could do H.265. And there's no control over uh, things like shutter speed in it. You've got white balance control, exposure shift. So the Black Magic is still more comprehensive, but definitely looking at the two, it's also more clunky. So yeah. I think this is going to have a big audience. And it has a killer app that people have been asking for forever, uh, which is multi-camera, right from camera capture to software, all completely integrated. No one has done this yet. So you got a few iPhones kicking around and you're recording a gig. You can run them all through the Apple camera software. It's going to show up in time in Final Cut as a multi-cam clip. You can click through. You can do live switching in your editing software while this is happening in real time as well. And we've seen a bunch of manufacturers, like Jaron was even yeah, testing you know, live streaming setups. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, go, Jaron, go. Um, <laughs> that'll give you this kind of option, but it's always been like, oh, the software is not quite there yet or the camera hardware or whatever. Uh, iPhones record incredible video, and now you're getting that with a, you know, maybe not the industry standard software, but Final Cut is still very established. And it might just become, you know, 300 bucks for currently a lifetime subscription to Final Cut. Uh, that's a no-brainer for a lot of people, yeah. and they've already got iPhones. Yeah, and I went and picked it's, up my my yeah. Logitech. So this is the 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 camera system that I was testing out while I was down in California, and uh, yeah, I I do think that based on what I'm seeing, the interface is a lot less clunky than this it one. It looks really intuitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
It's, and again, just once you're done that initial switching to already have it as a marked and labeled timeline. Well, the best part about all this is, is yeah. if you wanted to use this, you don't have to go buy hardware. Very yeah. feasibly, all these people already have iPhones. And so it just sort of works with what you've already got. And that's, I've never uh, seen a musician with Android, so their case <laughs> study is perfect. Now, so another interesting thing is like, haven't they actually, the new Final Cut for Mac, I know they've got to figure out a different naming convention, but the, the new Final Cut Pro for Mac, they've two. actually, two. Oh, no, they've, Angular, you're right, never mind. I'm no, thinking no, the yeah. iPad one. Yeah, the iPad, but they've brought features now that were popular on the Final Cut for iPad over now to, for Mac, right? Like the slow-mo, I believe. Um I, yeah, where it's like, going to build keyframes very similar to what we saw with the uh, Samsung device yeah. very recently. Um, is well, we're getting the sliders, kind of like photo editing style sliders uh, for video editing. Um, so that again, it just to make everything a little more seamless, but also again makes me more confused. Like they're <laughs> slowly making the interfaces closer and closer. Yes, but if I can't export a file on Final Cut for desktop. No. Uh, or just even, you know, outside of two creators like we are, sometimes you might just be like, I'm going on a road trip. I want to quickly keep working on my Final Cut project yeah. sure. uh, in the car. And that again, we're waiting for confirmation. We'll talk tomorrow. Doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, I can't point. I can't use my laptop on the airplane. Like, you know, what we'll often be sitting together. Well, your laptop for the reasons. Yeah. My gaming been. laptop. No. Yeah. So. So it'd be nice, you know, we thought, oh, the iPad will be great for this, but it's still not talking nicely Wait, can, to each other. Have you ever so. tried plugging it into those plugs in the, in the, in the chair? Yeah, it doesn't no, work. It, that's, it won't work. It draws too much power. <laughs> that's the plane a flight attendant crash. blows an air horn yeah. and runs yeah. over. No, the plane will crash. Disconnect this. We're losing altitude. Yeah. The plane will crash if I use my laptop. <laughs> so they, <laughs> You've thing. turned this into a glider. <laughs> um, before, I, before I loop us back to the conversation about cameras, um, oh. I do want to mention, Jordan, were you aware... This kind of flew under the radar a bit. Final Cut Pro 10.8 on Mac has AI for one-click color corrections and frame blending mm -hmm. through image generation. So here's the quote. For efficiency and post-production workflows, color corrections and video effects can now be given custom names in the inspector to easily identify changes applied to a clip, and effects can be dragged from the inspector to other clips in the timeline or viewer. The timeline index also offers the ability to search for and navigate to clips with missing yeah. media or effects. And text-based timeline search now includes important information like real scene camera angle and more. Nice. That's yeah, nice. It's going to be really nice for organization to be able to have, you know, a color wheel that's specifically for the sky. Yet previously it was like color wheel three. Now it'll be, I can actually label it like sky corrections and drag that around to other clips that need the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice way to do that. And then the auto correction is really interesting too, in that uh, we, I was quite excited when they announced Premiere has a new plugin that's going to recognize log footage and bring it to a you know 709 or 2020 color space automatically for you without having to go find the correct LUT for it. This is doing something similar. It says it's going to recognize raw and log footage and do an automatic base level adjustment, which is reversible and adjustable. Mm. Uh, and that's a big key there. The way LUTs worked on Final Cut uh, and still work. Uh, is kind of insane. It's <laughs> not the way people's workflow actually so works. You can't stack it. Yeah. Uh, so they are listening. But I suspect, knowing what's happened with Final Cut, this is another feature that's going to be piled on top of your other features. And I really think at this point, they need to just be like, look, our current LUT adjustment doesn't work properly. Everybody just does it through the color tools. Yeah. So um, let's just get rid of those and use this new one. Uh, but that doesn't look like the case. Again, I'm waiting to get my hands on the software. But you know what? What is clear to see is like Apple wants the iPad to now be more serious. I think they're really trying, at least the Pro series, to be more of like a mobile workstation, really more useful for creators. They're absolutely trying to integrate workflow between the phone, the iPad, and the iMac. You know, more so, uh, it's still some room to go, but they're they're working towards that. And it's clear now that they also want you to use a lot of their software programming and not have to go to third parties. So the future that they're going for is very obvious and yeah. very powerful. And it will, it will further cement that any creator getting into the game is going to want to use an Apple iPhone along with an iPad or an iMac or both yeah. 
in order to make this all work together. I mean, because the iMac, the, sorry, the iPad will work with the multicam as well. It uses the Final Cut, the new Final Absolutely. Cut. Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah, that's where camera they program envision it going through. Yeah. So you're using Final Cut camera and then sending your multicam to a tablet with Final Cut Perfect. Pro on it. That's yeah. the that's the grand vision. Um, and the tablet's uh, a cam, and you got your phone as B cam. Yeah, like, like that's, it's that's it's, great it, for most people. That's what I'm saying about when I when I originally said that Apple like they're embracing being a camera company. The features yeah. they announced announced here are what some companies entirely do as a camera thing. That's like the whole yeah. business proposition. And so like this is very this you're right. It signals what Apple wants to do and I'm pretty excited about it mainly because the iPhone has been a fantastic video camera and the best mobile video camera like on smartphones for the last yeah. several years and it's not close. And with the addition of ProRes and you've mentioned this Jordan it actually really surprised me. You've been using clips from the iPhone constantly and no one's noticed. I never yeah. saw. Yeah. I review all your videos <laughs> and I've never noticed that you were doing it until you pointed it out. And now I'm, I try and look for it and I still can't tell unless you tell me um, and or unless I shot the video like the one on the on the <laughs> X106. I shot the shot of your dongles <laughs> with yes. your iPhone. That's the only reason I knew that was on iPhone. And then yeah. when it showed up in the video, you did the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen right. face. Yeah, yeah, you did that. Uh, I just really quickly want to mention something I said at the top of this um, when I brought up photo editing. That's the missing piece here. Mm -hmm. They just have photos. It's all very basic. The app They're could saying, be better you too. You can use Lightroom uh, CC for your editing yeah. on those. Um, I do really think we're going to start to see them. I don't think it's going to be called Aperture, though that would be cool as hell. <laughs> but I think we'll see a professional high-end photo editing platform from them. I yeah. would love that. And I would love them to do a similar approach because they very, that, they've done something here that they've never done before. They You can shoot video on the standalone camera app and it's you have all the features there. They've said for a long time, if you want more, there's other options. Now they have yep. their own option. So now yep. that sort of tells me they are free to make a better camera app that they can yep. point to if anyone wants more control. You don't yep. have to, and if the thing that would be insane is if they manage to do what like Halide does, but then don't charge you for it, that would really hurt Halide, which is yeah, that's a what great I mean. app. Yeah. That's what I was saying before. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you know, it was always weird. They were saying, oh, we want this balance between what beginners need and what advanced photographers need. And so it was always a compromise either way. And it's like, well, why don't you just make a pro version? And they did. Yeah, a separate app the is the solution. Yeah. And this and is that's really basically smart. what they're doing now. Yeah. I'm yeah. just excited that like, when you when you're at a, like a beautiful place like Yellowstone or something, it won't just be like older folks with iPads taking pictures. It'll actually be like young creators. Finally, the us. young people yeah. will be out waving them yes, around. Yeah. Like, and it will block uh, yeah. our view even more effectively that's, than a phone does. That's so how it, it's that, so you're saying great. Apple brings us all together. Yeah, it yes. makes us it, despise each other. <laughs> it's the great equalizer, and it has it has become a deity, and we're all doomed. <laughs> all right, there we go. Let's move on. Uh, right. What have you been up to? Uh, why don't I go first? Oh, it was about first. to be my birthday uh, when we recorded our last pod. Yes. And I got to bring up uh, two things very quickly, um, very thoughtful gifts oh. uh, that I want to mention here. First one. What did your wife get you? Lego camcorder from my parents. Check that out. <laughs> I like it. Uh, comes like in a it. kit. You could do a photo camera. It looks a very cam, <laughs> right? A, oh, look at yeah. It's got like the old timey hinge. Dang. It's not fully articulating, so I did deduct a point on the Amazon reviews page for that. Uh, but fun little project. <laughs> my kid and I did it in a few hours, uh, so that was great. The big one that I really want to talk about is Chris gave me the Criterion 4K version of Citizen Kane. And this thing is big and expensive and four discs. And it was not something I was going to get for myself. And I have seen it. And if you love movies, then my God, is it worth it? Oh, like, you watched is, it? Oh, Liam and I were watching it yesterday, which again, oh. my, like I was he he's like, I want to see that movie that you were so excited about. And it's, it, it's like, but it, it's not for kids at all. And it was still, <laughs> he's just, watch, and this is huge credit to my son. He's like, this is some of the best lighting I've ever seen. And it's like, <laughs> you're my son. This is amazing. Um, uh, it's a very important movie, but the thing is the original negative was, is gone. Uh, so it's always been like some scenes look better than others. This is one of the most expensive restorations that's ever been done. Um, yeah. Like hand, every frame, denoised, sharpened, but it still looks incredibly organic. It is 
beautiful. So uh, nice. if you haven't seen it, because it does have a very, it's got a reputation as like a very unapproachable film, very dry. The Simpsons did not help with that. <laughs> um, but if you love film, it's insanely watchable and it's just, it looks like it was shot a week ago as opposed to 1941. So happy uh, birthday. Check it yeah, out. I, I am yeah, going to say you. this happy 40th birthday, Jordan. I didn't thank actually you, say that to you. I wanted to say it to you on camera. So happy 40th birthday. There you go. Thank you. I'm dying from this yeah, point forward. You are actively. We're all dying. Yeah. You're halfway That's why my dying. eyes look this way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go Chris. quick. Uh, I've got a little walleye here and a little pike here because it is now going to be pike season and walleye fishing season open tomorrow. So uh, I'm excited for that. I don't know what I'm going to do it though because yeah, it's so busy and we're not going to be in town and it's going to be rough. But hey, I'm, I'm still excited for opening season that I will get to enjoy. Um, Jaron, what have you been up to? I finished. So in the back corner of this view over here, you can, you can see it. It's right here. Uh, I had finished this. It's a meteor unit for one of my Gundams, and it's very, very large. But the gun, the Gundam that it came with, was trash quality, <laughs> like Ugh. really bad. Like oh, I was really? looking at it, and it looked horrible. So I like the or, little dude that mounts in the, the actual unit? important part. The Freedom Gundam looked bad, so I went and, and got a what's called a real grade, which is the same size but like way more detailed. Finished it and took the one that came with it and threw it away and put the, uh-huh. put this one together. And I, there you go. I do like it. And I showed this to Chris, too. I asked, I and I like, said, you're going to poke somebody's eye out with that thing. <laughs> I also <laughs> like these, this lighting effect over here. I've got it so that it'll like go from white to like red to mimic the firing of the weapon. I, I don't know. I thought that was oh cool, too. <laughs> anyway, that's me. Paint being your walls black and little stars all over it. And just yeah, then it would be perfect. into a Gundam battle scene. <laughs> Love it. Your couches can be asteroids and you can just, <laughs> they can just uh, endless duel. Also, endless if waltz. you've been, if you've been paying attention, uh, I should mention uh, based on the birthday thing, uh, I haven't been wearing a wedding ring for a really long time. My wife got me a wedding band. So uh, now I am uh, publicly. Yeah. So ladies, wet. leave them yeah. alone. Yeah. yeah ah. Stop it. Yeah. Oh, it's it's I'm trying to walk around the, the beaches of Vancouver Island. And yeah, it's. Oh, I got to travel with this guy. Like, and I'm, I'm like, he's no, married. No, he's stop. married. Stay, he's married. Yeah. Stay with him. <laughs> ladies and just, men, they just can't get their hands off Jordan. Now he can just flash the ring. They're taking parts off of them and throwing yeah. them at him. It's just, it's inappropriate. So I'm my glad decrepit that's... old uh, middle aged body is, yeah, um, really <laughs> inspiring feelings in a lot of people. Can we move on? Yes. We're going to move to tech support. There is no never read the comments today because tech support is overwhelmed so i'm dedicating this whole thing to tech support we're going to start with an email that we received from chris mcveigh hi folks i got into photography somewhat recently late 2022 and i've always found your content to be really useful i have a fuji xh2 with an 18 to 55 70 to 300 and 33 f 1.4 and a tamron 11 to 20 i mostly shoot wildlife landscape and some street and less often events for my work I have previously looked at upgrading and swapping the 18 to 55 for Sigma 18 to 50, Tamron 17 to 70, or Fuji 16 to 55, but didn't see a big enough upside to considering the relative cost, IQ factors, etc. However, a local store recently had the 16 to 55 at half price brand new, and I thought it was too good to pass up. My question is considering the IQ and versatility of the 16 to 55 as, well, as I'm also struggling to see the true upside of keeping the 33 as two as the 1.4 upside wouldn't be worth it. Budget is okay at the moment, so no urgency, but we're saving for a new house, making smart life decisions. Good, good job. I respect Maybe that. better than yeah. collecting excessive amounts of glass <laughs> that might not get used enough. Always enjoy hearing your take on these things. Keep up the great work. I'd still keep the 33. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have an extensive lineup here. The 33 does give you a break sometimes when you want to just push one focal length and not have to worry about it. You know, have have the fun of just exploring with one field of view. At the same time, 1.4 is advantageous, especially on APS-C. Two stops. Yeah, two stops. Four times as much light. Yeah, it's great that you got a faster 1655. It's a good lens. I think you'll enjoy it. So kudos on getting that for a good price. But uh, no, I don't know. Keep it. The big thing that jumped out to me is the 1655 is a lens I adore. It's a big sucker. And that 33 is really light. So just when you're going out for the day, having one small, uh, good low light option, I think is extremely useful. Yeah. All right. No more lenses. That's it. You're cut off. 
deposit no. for the house. Come Until, on. Until yeah, Jeez. okay. After the house down payment is yeah. in or yeah. renovations or whatever you've got in mind. More lenses. Yeah. Always more lenses. Real estate in this market? Come on. <laughs> Save your money. Jeez. Uh, all right. Next one is a speak pipe from Codron. I do believe this is a different Codron than the last Codron because I know we've talked to a Codron, but this voice sounded different. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Here we go. Let's listen in. Hello, Jordan, Jaren, and Chris. I decided to move to Mac OS. The most demanding task I will need to accomplish is photo and video editing, as you have about as many games for MacBooks as you have affordable Leicas. I will need to handle 45 megapixel photos and 4K 60 frames per second, 10 bit, without getting me frustrated without the sp- uh, with the speed. I don't have experience when it comes to editing on MacBooks with the Apple Silicon, so I thought I would ask people that have done this extensively. What should I be looking at? M1, M2? Do I need 32 gigs of RAM? I do know I want one terabyte of SSD, but that's about it. What do you think? Thank you for the show. So I think here, it's nice. I've got experience um, with, you know, the base M1, M1 Pro that I'm currently using right now, but I also got some time with the M2 Max. Uh, And what I can say is it really depends on your video and photo editing. If you're, you know, doing basic adjustments to a raw file uh, or you're sequencing 4K 60 with some B-roll over it and some music, you can get away with any of the current Apple Silicon on that. It is not that demanding at all. Like on the M1 Pro, the only time I butt up against things, uh, like recently with the Fuji X100, is I had um, a 6K A-roll with a green screen composite effect on top of it with motion on that. And then I was dropping 6K footage examples from the camera on it. And there I started to see like some dropped frames, Mm -hmm. which is something I'm not used to. That's where you're really going to see it. A conventional timeline, uh, most of the current apples are absolutely powerful enough for doing 4K 60, 45 megapixel. Your export times will go down as you get further and further there. Um, The big thing with RAM is, yeah, future proofing, essentially. Like you need less RAM on the silicons than you would have needed with like older Intel processors. Um, But it still does really help you. You know, if you might be moving to, you know, if you're getting into 4K video, uh, eventually 6K, 8K, that's where you see the difference with those. And I certainly saw it when we did our 8K camera shootout. Um, that's when I requested the M2 Max from Apple just so I could finish that project in a reasonable mm-hmm. amount of time. It made a big difference there. I think 32 gigs of RAM is your minimum, um, but it's you start to see it plateau. So yeah. you don't need... so like Diminishing returns for sure. For example, the M3 Max, which I had at 48 gigs, I believe, was outperforming the M1 Ultra with maxed out specs, like over 100 gigs. So like eventually, it, it's the chip itself is more powerful. So yeah. uh, I really think the M3 Max is probably way overkill for you, um, knowing that. But uh, yeah, what Jordan said, all the rest of it, I agree with. All right, let's do nice. another email. This one is from Diego Esqu- Esquadero. Hey, Petapixel podcast pals, love the show. I'd appreciate some advice creating a high quality portable setup while hopefully integrating with the Sony gear my wife already owns. That would be an a7 IV, a Sony 35GM, 50 macro, and a 24-105G and an 8518. He wants the idea of a, a take anywhere camera like the X100 or the GR, but without a fixed lens. So Especially bu- those fixed lenses, yeah. I bought the A7C II when it came out for travel photos, studio and candid photo shoots with friends, and street photography around New York, but our lenses make it feel large-ish, as you just ex- uh, said there, Chris. <laughs> Curiosity got the best of me, and I rented the A6700 body last week, along with the Sony FE40 f2.5 and Sigma APS-C 18-50. to I love the tiny zoom at f2.8, and the 40 was nice, but kind of wish it was f2 or 1.8. I did some unscientific testing at home to confirm the one-stop noise difference between A6700 and A7C II, not yep. sure yet if that's a deal breaker. Currently, I'm looking at two options. Keep my A7C2, keep sharing my wife's lenses, but get more small full frame primes for photos like the 42.5 so I don't lose megapixels on crop mode and use APS-C zooms for video since crop mode is still 4K. Or jump to the A6700 for the overall tiny APS-C lens setup, but at the detriment of being able to really share APS-C gear with my wife and giving up some stump stop of low light capability but keep 10-bit 4K video for nice grading in DaVinci. Is a super light and compact full-frame setup a (laughs) fool's errand? And what questions (laughs) should I ask myself to make the best gear choices? And I think this particular email 
is a very good microcosm of a feeling that a lot of Sony shooters are probably going through right now mm -hmm. because yeah. the X106 really does give you that. I really wish I had that, but with Sony vibes. So right. Chris. Yeah. You first. So when, when I first saw this email, my thought pattern was stick with the a seven C two. I mean, it is a very compact camera. It's a very capable camera. Uh, it is basically size wise only marginally larger than a 6,700 and yeah. modeled in a very similar way. It's the lenses, of course, that will be bigger. You do have a selection of lenses that you can use, which is handy, of course, but the 2405 F4G is not a small lens, you know, but it's a versatile lens. I get, though, that it still kind of feels large-ish. And so then I was thinking, well, you know what? Maybe they're not crazy about APS-C. Like, the one stop different in low light, honestly, it doesn't bother me personally. It might bother you. It doesn't bother me. I don't consider it a deal breaker. Modern APS-C cameras take beautiful photos in many different lighting situations. I mean, honestly. So it's it's really more the practicality of the smaller lenses. And the APS-C zooms are small and and affordable enough that you could get a kit without having to even worry about the the frugality of sharing lenses you know like you said like an 1850 for example great little lens very sharp versatile and quite compact you know that really does show the benefits of the smaller platform maybe get a couple primes to supplement that it depends what you like to shoot but you could get like an 85 mil equivalent you could get yourself an ultra wide um and that would be a really handy kit to carry around without having too much bulk so I don't know. I personally wouldn't mind using like an A7C2 with a with a lens. I, when I'm walking around town, I'm often using a kit like that and it doesn't overly bother me. But if you want something truly compact and pocketable, actually, I kind of think the APS-C solution is a good solution. I'm, I'm just going to, when I heard that, the immediate thing I thought was just Sigma Contemporary Primes. Um, yeah which are full frame. They're gorgeous. Um, I would probably go a seven C two with a bag of, with a few small primes just to have the ability to go back and forth with your wife. As you mentioned, the one thing I will mention though, is you did touch on video. If that's important to you, the C two does have a heavy crop. If you're going to do 4k 60, um, and no 4k 120 option, which the 6,700 does offer. Uh, so it's up to you whether or not that's worth the stop of light loss. But I think you can absolutely still put together a small, uh, excellent package in full frame. Uh, it just might not be all Sony glass. But then you're then you're swapping lenses. All right. Which is fun. <laughs> uh, next one's another speak pipe. This one is from John Westerlin. Let's listen in. Hi, guys. Huge fan. I have been enjoying your content since the camera store days and have purchased many cameras based on your recommendation, um, probably a half dozen or so, um, from every company you can imagine, a few Fujis, a few Nikons, a few Canons, um, and a couple Panasonics as well. My question is, I have always been interested in Olympus or OM system now, mostly for the computational photography and the rugged ruggedness. It's always seemed very cool to me, but I've never been able to pull the trigger because I've been worried about image quality. I do a lot of kids' sports and, and some landscapes. Um, I'd like to get into wildlife photography. Um, so I guess my question is, do you see a serious loss in quality from, say, an OM Systems OM-1? Mark II versus, say, a Canon R8 or a Nikon Z6 II. Um, that's my question. Uh, thanks for everything you guys do. Really enjoy the show. You mean you picked... Of course there's going to be an image quality difference when a Z6 yeah. II. The sensors are four times the size. <laughs> yeah, micro you know, four thirds. <laughs> but put this within context, I guess. Well, uh, the things that you mentioned, like compact size and ruggedness are, are huge benefits. Computational photography, they're fantastic. So especially with OM system, those are very tangible benefits. You will absolutely, like, you know, when it comes to image quality loss, and I think somebody else asked me this on the podcast before, like how important is image quality to you? And, and it's not that important to me in regards to, to low light performance and stuff, because I still think a good photo is a good photo regardless. But 
you will absolutely, if you look at, at Z62 files next to OM system files, you're going to be like, ah, oh, this is, this looks terrible. And that's because you're looking in the context of pixel peeping and whatnot. In the actual context of a photograph, I think OM system take perfectly great photos. You know, it would really depend on your output, how you're going to display these, how you're going to use them. Uh, I, I really don't think it's that big a deal, but there's absolutely a perceptible difference. And that does throw off a lot of people. And if you want to shoot a lot of low light, high ISO stuff, yes, absolutely. It's it's not a good platform for that. But in good light, light is everything anyways in photography. So if we're talking beautiful light, good light, you absolutely have a compact camera that's very rugged, that's easy to take anywhere, and that really alleviates having to bring other things like filters and tripods in a lot of situations. And those are very tangible benefits. I see a uh, difference. I just want to say... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can I go first? Go ahead, Jaren. Okay. Yeah. I, when editing the X106 files, for example, immediately see the file start to give out on me way sooner than when I'm editing a Sony full frame file, like a modern Absolutely. camera file. So like, that's already a thing, but I don't care because I got benefits that are different than image quality. And I like that exactly. camera in spite of them. Now you can go, Jordan. Yeah, I just want to say it's like OM system and Olympus before recognized this and they're just like, how can we offset all the downsides to our smaller sensor? And that's where the computational stuff is fantastic. Like if you shoot a handheld high res file, you're getting very similar DR and detail to a full frame yeah. camera because it's compositing a whole bunch of images. Same if you do the cool stuff like the live ND field feature, suddenly your shadow noise drops. That's awesome. The issue with the email that you sent, as you mentioned, kids sports and wildlife, which are two areas where you need fast shutter speeds and you might have to crank the ISO. You can't stack a bunch of images to make up for that. Yeah. And that is where you'll see the difference. If you go out and shoot landscape, portrait, and take proper advantage of those computational photography features, you can make up a lot of that difference. Uh, the other thing is you can get extremely bright lenses. Like I use the F1.7 Panasonic zooms all the time to, again, make up for some of that deficit, to have a zoom that's extremely bright, um, that the higher uh, ISO performance is going to ding you on. But now you're into a bulkier system again, and that might not be what you want. So I absolutely adore the computational stuff on OM cameras and Lumix as well um, for making up that image quality difference, but it doesn't work for everything. There we go. Uh, the next one is an email from Lorenzo Parago. Hello, everyone, and congrats on the great podcast. Oh, thanks. Since you've spoken before about underwater cameras, and I know Chris is an avid fly fisherman, I have a question for you. I worked in photography for many years, then left it and picked it up again recently as a hobby. I was shocked by the progress jumping from my old Nikon D300s to a ZFC and then a ZF. Exclamation point. Oh, yeah. I took the photo attached, and I'll put it on screen now, on a Pentax Optio W60 while fishing with my dad on the Mastalone River in northern Italy. Boy, that sounds great, doesn't it, Chris? It, I want to go there so bad. Yeah, I want to own a winery <laughs> right in the Dolomites and fish every day. That's I, that's my dream. It's I was wondering happen. if I buy a modern waterproof <laughs> camera and then which one? Well, I see a big as a jump as between the two big Nikons he mentioned. Thanks, Lorenzo. Boy, underwater is a weird one. Yeah. yeah. So first off, Good light makes photographs beautiful. I mean, this is beautiful light. It's a nice photograph. If you zoom in and look at it, it looks not great from, from the yeah, standpoint water color. of the technical. Yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately, point and shoot cameras have not improved optically um, in that time frame the way that conventional larger sensor cameras have. So no, if you do get a modern waterproof camera, it's largely going to be the same image quality you had before, but it'll give you the same benefits too, rugged and everything like that. I mean... I love fly fishing and I still don't love, I mean, I love it more than pretty much anything. And I still wouldn't use like a, a full SLR in an underwater kit or something like that, just because it's so much to carry, unless you're going to be the dude that films your friends and photographs your buddies and you're not fishing, I wouldn't do it. You'll hate it. Um, an interesting, I'm going to go on a different tangent rather than getting yourself like a, a newer Pentax Opti or whatever, uh, or Olympus Rub, you know, tough series. I would actually look at using a smartphone 
Maybe mm. one that you're not going to use is your main smartphone, but a lot of smartphones are are waterproof enough for this kind of work. Oh, where yeah. you're putting the camera underwater yeah. and shooting, and they actually do a great job. I, I did a project where we went up to Fortress Lake fly fishing, and I, I think it was it was a Pixel, probably the Pixel six or seven back then. But it was rated waterproof down to like three meters. And so I stuck that phone under all sorts of stuff, no case, nothing. And it actually takes beautiful photos. You're getting the stacked imaging, the computational benefits. And so the sharpness and the the noise and stuff was actually really very acceptable. And uh, that might be something to try. If in fresh water. Can I, I highlight that <laughs> yeah, enormously? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then let it fully dry before plugging it in. That's the 100%. other thing. Um, That's what I did, yeah. If, but it worked fine. Like days of use underwater and it was fine. It survived. But you got to be a little bit, you got to do some maintenance. But technically you're supposed to do that with a point and shoot underwater camera as well. If that yeah. gives you a belly niggle, and that's my term for it makes your stomach feel weird like putting a smartphone in. Um, <laughs> I can say that GoPro's most recent ones and yeah. also Insta360's um, Ace Pro mentioned earlier, both have built in color correction filters for working specifically underwater. And they yep. do take pictures. GoPro's camera quality for pictures is meh. And I yeah. don't think that that Insta360s is better, but it's a smaller investment that is designed to be fully submerged for a while. And you could go with that if you wanted to. But I'm going crazy. I'm going to go with the crazy smartphone suggestion, honestly. I don't I mean, everybody's dislike got it. Everybody's yeah, got I, I think the ultra wide is really limiting underwater is my issue with the GoPro or mm. Insta 360. Yeah. Like those ultra wides, you're scooshing it right scooshing. up. Scooshing. Something. Scooshing <laughs> is the technical. Also put that definition on screen. You can't. I just made it up. <laughs> Joke's on you. Um, yeah, I, I think the big thing you said, like the image quality jump from the 300 to the modern cameras. Well, you also jumped up a sensor size. Um, when you did that, which will definitely impact that image quality difference. I'm going to keep beating my drum. I want a one inch or larger, uh, like a type one, sorry, yeah. but this is 2024 yeah, yeah, now, not actually an a type long. one or larger uh, sensor. Um, I love the concept of the Nikon AW1 that never carried through. I know Sea Life have made one inch underwater cameras, but apparently the interface okay. is really rocky on those. They're not ideal. So major camera manufacturer, if you make this, people will be excited to use it because I am also a person who to test cameras has put my phone underwater, but the entire time I'm just like completely <laughs> rattled and on edge. Uh, so you? I don't like doing that. Me <laughs> rattled and on edge. Rock, rock what? solid, never phased Jordan Drake uh, was a little, <laughs> a little squiffy. Also throw the squiffy. definition you of that. So we got a belly niggle, squiffy yeah, niggles and squiffy. All sorts of words now. Chris, Who's what's that? yours? For something uh, that I you're use, uncomfortable I doing. I use regular words. Uncomfortable. All okay. right. Okay. What a boring word. I use I I use disorientated. That's not a word. And I get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> and and whilst whilst I'm we not got allowed to use three whilst. more. Let's do Luke from Boston. This is a speak pipe. Let's listen in. Hi, Chris, Jordan, and Jaron. This is Luke from Boston. I'm currently invested in the Canon mirrorless ecosystem as a hobbyist, but don't have any L glass. I've recently been tempted to switch over to the Nikon ZF for the retro body and access to third-party lenses, particularly the Tamron 35 and 150. Given the recent news about Canon opening up the RF mount, I don't plan on switching now, but I was wondering, do you think Canon is seriously interested in making a retro-style mirrorless camera? If so, do you think they're more interested in an ILC or a point-and-shoot akin to the Fuji X100s? Thanks so much. I don't uh. think Canon wants to take any risks right now. <laughs> no, nothing, not at all. Yeah. If they do, I think a fixed lens is way more likely, but even then, I mean, Canon just, it, it's crazy. They have such incredible heritage that they seem terrified by. Dude, uh, can you imagine a digital Canon at 28 and Canon at oh, 43? Like I'd the, have four the, of them. Yeah. The, yeah so the my 17, mic would be terrible yeah. because they'd be clinking against each other the whole time I'm no, trying no. to record a, a podcast, but I would QL19. want them with me at all times. <laughs> QL 17 and QL 19, like digital, that would be awesome. I would, I think that would do so well. It's such a cute little camera. Canon but, only uh, recently said that they thought that there was possibility in the idea of, see how, how many things I had to stack on there for them to express <laughs> how an executive from Canon talks, um, that they were thinking that it's possible that maybe someone from their past, a, a previous camera might come up in an, a design in the future. That means we're years away. 
Yeah, yeah of they, course. they'll do a they'll do a mirrorless camera in the style of their classic 5D Mark II. Yeah, that's of course. as far back as they'd <laughs> yeah. be willing to go. I so I, I'm not going to say that you know that's a for sure. I have no idea. Canon doesn't. I don't think they're serious. I have about no that. information about a a retro camera coming from them. Um, it could come. I doubt it. But you know, I, been I would love to about? be wrong. Love to be wrong. <laughs> Has it been bandied about in a boardroom? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is it serious? I doubt it. Yeah. And may that Tamron 35 to 150 please come to Canon shooters because... Uh, Is it a full-frame lens, support lens? I, yeah, then it's it a won't. full-frame lens. It's Yeah, I know. At this point, it won't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> man, I wouldn't invest in a system that didn't have a 35 150 Tamron. Next one is a email from Mike Miller. Ooh, Dear yeah. Jaron, Jordan, and Chris, I like how our names get jumbled up depending on who asks. It can go Jaron, That's Jordan, great. Chris. You it can, can go tell Jordan, which, Chris, how they rank us every <laughs> time. That's a definitive... <laughs> I'm a subscriber to the audio podcast since day one and a fan of Chris and Jordan since the camera store days back in 2017. You're crazy, but we love you. I have two questions. One, with focus stacking, are better results obtained by keeping the camera in one position and adjusting the focus or by keeping the focus locked and using a macro rail to move the camera back and forth? Answer that one first. Chris, go. Oh, uh, I don't do a lot of focus stacking, but... Okay, uh, I'll go. (laughs) No. (laughs) I think, uh, do I think, not do not move the camera for focus stacking. Your oh, perspective yeah. will shift. They'll never match yes. up. Do not do that. You need to twist the focus ring on the lens. And that's why breathing is important. If you're going to stack issues, you want minimal breathing. So you don't lose a bunch of your image when you do it. Okay, go, Chris. You stole it. No, I was, I was going to. Yeah, gonna that, you that. answered that really definitively. There's nothing he can add to that. <laughs> um, okay, se- uh, question two. When making long exposures, 15 to 30 seconds or longer, common wisdom is to use a remote shutter release, mirror lockup, or a two second timer to minimize blurriness caused by camera yes. shake and the mirror flapping. With a half second exposure, I can see how a bit of camera shake could cause an is- issue. Yet with a 15 second or longer exposure, the shaking becomes negligible compared to the overall exposure time. Have any yep. studies been done to debunk the pressing of the shutter or mirror flap on long exposures? I haven't used a mirror in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the the concept being, of course, yes, the amount of exposure that would actually take place during that amount of shake would be minimal. But it does depend, of, you know, the thing with night exposures does depend on how bright individual objects are in the scene, right? So, for example, like a cityscape, yeah, your, your shadow areas, you're not going to have any problems with blur. But bright highlights, street lights, things like that absolutely would, even with a little bit of movement, you're going to get some jiggle, you're going to cause some softness. Regardless, I feel like if you're taking the time to put a camera on a tripod, why not also take the time to then just not have any sort of motion blur shake, even if it is negligible. So uh, I, I'm still a proponent of always use the self timer or a cable release or something like that. Um, I, yeah, I don't think a cable release is a, it's a pretty yeah, outdated exactly. unless you're using the Come camera. Come on, at this point. people still use but two cable second releases. timer. Yeah, the two second timer. Two best second friend. timer. Yeah, it's you guys friend. are monsters. People use cable releases all the time. Besides, I not everybody like has. I would like everybody. a list of things I've been accused of being a monster it's for really, on this really podcast, long. and they are very minor yeah, things. Monstrous. For the most part. Oh my gosh. I mean, like, if maybe Mike is using a 5D Mark II. You don't know. Why would you assume that it's got everybody's got well, the he did say He did say mirror flap, so he's using something with a mirror. So yeah, use the yeah, cable release. DSLR. Sure. 5D2 has two second timer. Yeah. Oh 5D2. my gosh. That's anyway, sometimes that two seconds is a big deal, right? Like right. if you're trying to get timing of something driving over a bridge or something. That's true. This is a hill that's, that we're willing to That's die. fair. I'll give right. that to you, Chris. You can have that Jeez. one. Here you go. You know? Anyways. Use a cable release and nothing but a cable release. Yeah, forever. <laughs> All right. Last one is Chris a- Nichols branded cable release yes. is coming soon. Even from if your the favorite. difference be negligible, you'll know. You'll know you could have taken a better In your photograph. heart, you'll be disappointed yep. in yourself. Like, could away this at you, picture Mike. have been better if I'd used a two second timer or <laughs> yes. cable release? Oh interchangeable. Jesus Christ. And if you're a YouTuber, someone will pixel peep that stuff and then give you a whole dissertation on why you screwed up. And this I sounds probably very personal. Things. This is suddenly getting really <laughs> specific. Like that's actually happened. Right. I'm going right. to let us that's, move that's on. That's happened to the many, many times. Podcasting many, many, many in lieu times. of therapy. The, the yes, final one is for Speakpipe from Ryan. Let's listen in. Hello, Petapixel Podcast. This is Ryan in Seattle, and I have the age-old question around selling prints of my photos. Um, I'm trying to decide if it's worthwhile to continue using third-party printing services or buying my own printer and printing at home. And my motivation to print at home is obviously to reduce cost in the long run. And 
handle the shipping process. It is really nice though to be able to drop ship photos to people, but I feel like I'm out of the loop and it's less personal and you know, I'm not able to sign them or number them or anything like that. Uh, I'm curious what other folks do in these situations. Like how do you sell your pictures as cheaply as possible, but with the best quality? Mm. So how patient a person are you and how much free time do you have? I guess would be my question, yeah. Ryan. Uh, you know, printing, I totally get it as an artist. If you want to print your own work, that's a beautiful thing to be able to do. Uh, in the long run, you could reduce your costs. Absolutely. And you do get to personalize the, the prints. Um, but then you do have to handle the shipping and you have to handle all of that stuff. You also have to learn how to photo print and it is yeah. still not any easier now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Like it's, we could release a tutorial video from when we started YouTube on how to print your photos, release it now. And the background of the operating system we were on would change, but it would be the same insanely (laughs) tedious process outside of that. You're still looking at, at using like, you know, um, colorimeters to, to actually calibrate your printing, uh, all the expense of doing that, you know, making sure your monitor is calibrated, which I'm assuming it is, but like, it really becomes a very technical world of calibration, paper choice, uh, the printer that you're going to use, uh, you know, and of course all the issues just with head scrapes and with proper platen gaps and, and, and ink quality and, you know, expiry dates. And like, it's, it's a, it's an industry unto itself, which is why people have made an industry out of it. And so if you are so technically minded and you don't find that daunting, you want to really learn that. Um, awesome. I know a lot of people that do their own from start to finish, but I can see why a lot of people rely on a third party a printer to do it. And, and if you have a company that you like, that's giving mm-hmm. good results that your clients like, uh, I, I would, I don't know. I I'd used be I would, to stick with it. I've owned uh, two different Canon Pro 1000s, by the way. And the reason I don't own either of them now is because I've moved. And I don't know if you guys know this, but once you've un- unboxed and set up one of those high-end yeah. nice printers that is capable of producing results you'd want to sell, you can't don't move, it. move it. You move yeah. it, it breaks. The yeah. printer doesn't work right. I'm I'm not even exaggerating. I picked up the printer that after I had moved it once and there was ink on my hands. It was leaking yeah, because I had gently moved it from one area to another. <laughs> and Canon doesn't want it back if something goes wrong out of the box. Like if you get something, they, they know they can't receive that back because it's going to yeah. be yeah. hella broken when it gets to them. So if, you, if you're forever in your position, fine, great, go for it. But you can never move it once it's there or you have to buy a new one. Yeah. Now, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that Jeremy, who I've mentioned already, uh, he loves buying prints and supporting other photographers. And one that he does support is a photographer named Ben Horn. And mm-hmm. Ben Horn does landscape photography, prints his own pictures, and sends them to the people who support him. And his prints are small. They're like little ones. He's not doing big ones or anything. He's just doing like small ones. And he does print his Smart. own. Smart. So it is a way to keep it affordable, keep him involved in that process, and uh, yeah, it, his pictures are I mean, really good. Yeah, eventually you work out a workflow and it, it's smooth. And, and and assuming nothing changes, it works great. But I do promise you, if you go down this route, there will be moments, especially at the start or, or learning, where if you had a button that could explode the entire earth and eradicate everything, you would use it. So just consider that. Keep that in mind. That's true. There will be those moments. I just want to point out a quick middle ground. Uh, You talked about doing like online printing and having that sent out. Uh, Find a local printer who does really good work that you Mm, trust for those special prints. Like we have our good friends at Resolve here in town. They're going to do a great job. I can label it and they're going to deal with all the calibration, printing, all that. You'll walk into your printer and they will have their head in their hands weeping (laughs) um, and you will have dodged that and you will still get lovely prints if you work together regularly. That is is what my dad did. As well. By the way, all yeah. the prints that are in the house that I was talking about uh, weeks ago on the podcast, he did not print those at home. He went to a printer and then he matted and framed them himself. So there's still yep. the personal touch there if you do it that way. Yep. All right. Good luck. That does it. That's the podcast. That's it. Wow. We did it. Thanks yeah. for I'm going to reveal at the very end of this podcast that I am quite sick and I'm on a huge cocktail of cold medication. Wow, it's working. And really it well. did a great yeah, job. I couldn't so tell. I recommend modern medicine. <laughs> Jordan Drake right. is thumbs up on that. And yeah, now I've got to go work sick, with please. you and get sick. I'm going to yeah. get sick. It's yeah. terrible. All right. I'll keep my distance. We're no. shooting everything on tellies today. <laughs> 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 All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again to OM System for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you go to uh, explore.omsystem.com slash pedophile 
Metapixel to check out that EM10 Mark IV bundle. It's a good deal. After uh, that, then, then yeah, that's it. I got nothing else. Okay, I'm going to wave with my cool wedding band. Check that out. Okay, bye. bye, everyone. Oh, lovely. Bye. Bye. bye.